Here we go. So welcome, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to uh, this uh, event of the EAG Local Chapter Netherlands. Uh, tonight, uh, we are here to talk about uh, Toward uh, Wavescope uh, with uh, Ivan Vasconcelos. Uh, uh, before uh, introducing him or uh, uh, leaving the actually the um, uh, the presentation and uh, uh, the preparation of the introduction to the speaker to Hannes Kucha. Uh, I uh, will uh, welcome uh, the EAG community as usual. Uh, so I want to welcome uh, the uh, usual friends from the other local chapters, uh, uh, in particular uh, local chapter London, Paris, Oslo and Aberdeen and now Germany. Uh, and uh, also uh, this uh, EAG special interest communities. Uh, we uh, organize some events together with the decarbonization and energy transition with the artificial intelligence community. So we are in touch with uh, uh, also mineral exploration uh, society. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, uh, we are organizing the, these events also with the students. Uh, so we have the local chapter in Delft, DOGS, uh, but also uh, the one in Aachen. Um, we are in touch with the Oslo Society of Exploration Geophysicists. And so uh, I'm welcoming all this community as usual uh, also to this talk. Uh, we are looking for uh, uh, people helping out uh, to organize these and other events. Uh, so if you want to reach us uh, to join the event, but also to help us, uh, we are on LinkedIn, uh, or you can also contact us uh, on our uh, email address. Uh, EAG local chapter Netherlands at gmail.com. And uh, now I will uh, uh, leave uh, uh, the mic to Hannes uh, that uh, organized more this event uh, so that he can introduce uh, today's agenda and also the speaker. Thank you very much, Diego. And also from my side, uh, welcome and thank you for coming and, and joining this event. Today, uh, Dr. Ivan Vasconcelos who is an assistant professor of applied geoscience at the Department of Earth Science in Utrecht. He will talk about uh, toward a wave scope, AI-driven Bayesian imaging and monitoring of sub-wavelength microstructures with finite frequency waves. And uh, if you go to the next uh, uh, question, yeah. Uh, next slide. So uh, we will, by the way, uh, have a survey at the end. So. Uh, when this event is finished, please don't forget to uh, to it's just three questions. Just uh, fill them in. It's just like, uh, are you EHE member? Uh, did you like the talk? Do you want more of this? And maybe you want to suggest a speaker, right? Um, during Ivan's uh, talk, you can already uh, ask questions if you like, you know, so you don't forget them. And there's this uh, chat box or even the Q and A box that you can see there. You can click on it, and we would prefer if you could uh, address your questions to all the panelists, right? So Florencia, who will take care of this, uh, she can then read it. Uh, we forget it, no problem, but you know, it would be nice if you can do this. Uh, and then after the event, uh, if you like, we will then unmute everyone uh, so we can have a social uh, interaction and discussion. And uh, But before that, you can have your normal questions where uh, when, you are, when it's your turn, then you can also be unmuted. So if you have a follow-up question, then, uh, you know, that can be like a little discussion. All right, so without further ado, uh, next slide, uh, let's introduce Ivan. So he is an assistant professor of applied geoscience at the Utrecht University since 2016. His research focuses on imaging science, where he primarily uh, works in geophysical and rock physics applications and at field and laboratory scales, but also with strong multidisciplinary ties to material sciences, engineering and medical imaging. He received his PhD in geophysics from the Colorado School of Mines in 2007. And before rejoining academia, he worked in the industrial research at Ion Geophysical and at uh, Schlumberger uh, for another six years. And then he's also the author of over 50 peer reviewed publications and 12 patents. Uh, he's recognized as a leading expert in imaging, having received the 2014 SEGJ Clarence Karcher Award for Outstanding Young Scientists. And he is also honored as the youngest ever SEG honorary lecturer in 2018. 
He has, ser uh, he has uh, served in the editorial boards of Geophysics and uh, Geophysical Journal International, and he regularly referees across disciplines, for instance, physical review journals, natural materials, IEEE journals, and so on. So with that, I would say let's uh, give the presenting rights to uh, Ivan, and uh, yeah, I wish you all a good talk. So now, right. Ivan, you should uh, be able to present now. Thank you. I will. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks very much uh, for the uh, really kind introduction and for having me here today. This is really exciting. I'm really excited to share this with you. So I just wanted to say hello uh, here so you can look at me. And now I will stop my video so I can share my screen with you and have enough bandwidth. And you can tell me if things are working. Um, so let's share that. Um, Yes, we can see the slide. Yes. Yes. Does everything yes. look good? Yeah, you can go. All right. I'm going to just set up my laser pointer. Leave it here in the corner. All right. Well, thanks everybody. Uh, it's great to have you here today. I'm really excited to talk to you about this topic. If you've uh, met me before, or if you've seen any of the work that I did in the past, or that my group does. And you'll know that we generally work on things like migration type imaging, full waveform inversion. Uh, we work on this Marchenko redatoming business. So this is a bit of a topic that you probably didn't know we worked on things like this, but this is an interest I've had since I was a PhD student and I actually started working on an isotropy when I was a PhD student. And I've kept tabs on this field since then. And in fact, Young Zhao, the second, the, the, the third co-author that I have here is a colleague and friend that I've had uh, since then. He, is, he got his PhD from Princeton in material science, actually. He's not a geophysicist at all. And he's now a material science professor at Arizona, Arizona State University. Walter Klassens, uh, the second person that you see here, is one of our uh, master's students at Utrecht University who did a spectacular job. So when, when we get to the Bayesian AI part at the end, uh, he was behind doing a lot of the actual um, exercises of going through the motions and setting things up together with me. Andre Niemeyer and Susanna Hunks are my colleagues at Utrecht, so both professors, and they're in rock physics. So their input when it comes to microstructures and rock physics is extremely important to this work. As you'll see, this work combines the usual stuff that we think about when it comes to waves and things like this with both material science as well as rock physics. So without further ado, uh, we'll get started. And to get started, I wanted to just share a couple of images with you here. And on, on the left-hand side, you see a very uh, well-known set of images. So on the right here, so both are 2D slices of uh, time-migrated images of the Utsida formation. Um, in Sleipner, Sleipner is the name of the field. This is one of the first uh, monitored, geophysically monitored CO2 capture um, experiments ever done. So you can see that actually it started in 1994. And you can see here the time-lapse images uh, from 1994 to 1999. And you see these amplitude anomalies that are associated with the CO2 plume um, after um, five years of injection here. And of course, uh, the changes here in both in terms of amplitude and structure have to do the changes on the mechanical properties of the, of the uh, subsurface, which are in turn due to changes uh, of what's in the pores of the rock. So we'll talk about that a fair bit uh, in, this, uh, in this talk. I also wanted to show you here uh, this cool picture of Sharad. So Sharad is one of the two satellites um, GPR uh, setups uh, that are currently orbiting Mars. And there's plenty of data from both Sharad and Marsis. So those are the two uh, types of GPR data. And you can see here a 3D image and a 3D image of the North Pole of Mars. Um, and you can see there's a part where there's no data just because of the uh, uh, orbit of the satellites. And you can see cross sections here uh, in different directions. And you see the substructure, uh, the subsurface of Mars. And it's because of the bright and uh, less bright features of this that people interpret Mars to have uh, 
water and its subsurface. It would be wonderful if we could take the quantities coming out of uh, radar here and turn them into quantifiable properties of what's beneath the wavelength here, controlling uh, the reflectivity of radar. So that would be great if we could do that. Likewise, it would be great if we could translate the information that is in the seismic here in terms of amplitude and other parameters that are mechanical into microstructure properties. Now, we're very good at imaging in general. When I say we, I say we as a community in, in seismic, right? So here I have an example uh, from my former PhD student, Tianxi Sui, who graduated from ETH uh, last year. Uh, and you see here, it, it, the, the particulars don't matter very much, but you have a synthetic model. There's a little window here where we want to get a better velocity model. Let's say this is our background model before we try to improve it. And then we do some tricks, we use some Marchenko stuff, we combine it with FWI, and then we get the picture of the target that you see here on C. Right? And if you compare it to what it's supposed to be, this is a pretty good picture. And this is not to say that we're the ones that do this best, it's to say that this type of result is a type of result that you often see in the uh, geophysical literature these days. And it's not that imaging doesn't have its own challenges in terms of research, of course it does, and people will still be working on things like this for many years to come. But overall, imaging seismic properties or imaging GPR properties. So always please think of both seismic and EM throughout this talk, although I'll, for the most part mention mechanics, although I will show EM examples as well. Uh, these are mature imaging fields, right? What, what is harder to do is to see structure that is much smaller than the wavelength, right? And so what creates structure that we can more easily image versus what creates structure that is harder to image? Well, to do that, let's take a look here at a comparison of scales, okay? So here I'm showing you four pictures uh, from top to bottom, left to right, going from bigger scales to smaller scales. Now I'm comparing the size of these images to some lambda here. And I want you to think of lambda as a archetypical P wave exploration length scale, okay? So the Archetypical P wave exploration length scale is of about 100 meters, order of magnitude, right? Uh, so that means uh, you get 10 to the second times 100 meters there, and that's the size of a satellite picture, right? So when you look at seismic, really, really large seismic images, that's the scale that you're looking at. When you look at a cross section of seismic and you can see uh, the various reflectors in it, you're often looking at something on the scale of the Grand Canyon, right? So you're looking at tens, uh, tens of wavelengths across, and it's about the size of Grand Canyon. Now here at the bottom, you see an outcrop, and you see some cracks in the outcrop. You see a person here for reference. This is already 10 times smaller than the wavelength than average, okay? So these features that you see here, they don't generate visible scattering, right? They don't appear as reflectors. You wouldn't be able to map these cracks as reflections in seismic data and make an image that, that one to run represented this structure because this structure is below the wavelength, okay? And of course, rock fabric, so here you have a picture of mineralogy is much smaller than the wavelength. Nevertheless, uh, the patterns and the properties of what exists below the wavelength get carried through the information that we record on the data. Uh, we'll talk a lot about that today because the goal we have is to discuss how can we get data and retrieve some information that is below the wavelength, right? That's the goal of today. And by the way, I use this term wave scope, which I coined, I made it up. And I made it up because I think it's nice to relate this to a microscope uh, in, the, in a conceptual sense, right? But it's nothing more than just a made up term uh, for us to think of trying to resolve things that we can't see with our own eyes and our own eyes being conventional seismic imaging. Uh, that images things at wavelengths of about a quarter of a wavelength or greater, right? So how does this relate to some of our challenges today? I just wanted to mention this here that, you know, these days, and especially in the Netherlands and in Europe, we talk a lot about sustainability and the energy transition and the things that are going to happen to the subsurface as, as a result of this, right? So here I have some pictures from a paper uh, by Susanna Hunks's group, and this is one of our uh, collaborators here. And what you see here is we're talking about hydrogen storage. If you haven't heard about this, hydrogen is not an energy source, it's an energy carrier. So you can think of it as a battery 
And if you have some sort of renewable energy production, this here is the purple line that we see. It, it usually goes up and down, say, according to seasons, for example. And when it's up, it usually can produce more energy in principle than the demand. But when it's down, it can be below the demand. And what you, what you don't want is to have to have to use uh, hydrocarbons. It will, it will be what we do for a while now. But what you don't want eventually is to have to rely on hydrocarbons when the energy goes down. So the idea is you bring something like hydrogen, uh, you can put it in the subsurface uh, during the months uh, where you have a surplus of renewable energy and you can take it out and use it like a battery uh, when uh, the renewable energy goes down, that by uh, supplying demand constantly. Now in this paper, they highlight several risks to this uh, over different types of risks. So you can see here uh, risks related to the hydrogeology, to the water table, risks related to microbial activity, geochemistry, and mechanical risks, right? If you look at the at the words that you see going around, the scale at which these processes are occurring are relatively small scale, especially compared to most seismic or mechanical wavelengths, or even radar, uh, depending on which one we use, uh, if we want to observe the subsurface. So all of the things that we're talking about here happen at a small scale. Now let's look at something else. Let's look at geothermal, for example. Geothermal is also a big deal. It's happening in the Netherlands. At, at least it's being pushed for. Uh, so we should see some of it in the next 10 years or so. And here you have from a paper an experimental example where we, they took granite and subjected it to hot water for long periods of time and on, under pressure. And you can see in the sample itself that there's been an alteration of the rock. You can see cracks with your own eyes. But in fact, if you look at the CT here, so this is before and it shows you the voids before. And this is after, and the after is showing you cracks in blue. And in dark, uh, in light gray here, it's showing you an increase in microporosity throughout the entire sample. So the sample got more porous and the sample got more brittle uh, because of these cracks. And we would like to know that this is happening because it could be associated, for example, with subsidence or with the risk of microseismicity. So would we be able to get any of this information is the question. What about CO2 sequestration? Well, now it's well known in CO2 sequestration uh, that CO2, of course, uh, replaces whatever fluid is in the pores. Usually it's brine. Uh, so we already have a fluid replacement uh, uh, phenomenon happening, but it can also react with the microstructure. So you see uh, from my colleague, Suzanne Hungs, uh, you see two examples of the microstructure before and after CO2 sequestration. Note that the picture in I here, the picture after, is about two times the scale of the picture before. So if you see here, this is 500 micrometers. This is about a millimeter. So think that this picture here is about half of this picture here in terms of scale. So clearly the microstructure has changed. What's interesting here is that we actually have some uh, wave data from ultrasonics. So these are a standard um, transducer ultrasonics, but you see the waveforms here. In Susanna's paper, they look at the change in travel time and they try to measure that by looking at the peaks here of the first arrivals. Okay, so they're using that as a proxy for a change in travel time. You can see that the change of travel time is relatively small, but I like to point out at this point that the change in the waveforms is actually pretty significant. You can see it with your eyes with no, no effort that the change in waveforms, starting from the brine sample here towards the black samples, clearly shows an increase in attenuation. We'll come back to this, right, uh, later on in this talk. So this is very clear evidence that there's a lot of information in the waveform related to the change in microstructure. Bear in mind that there's nothing else happening in this experiment. There's only microstructure and CO2 sequestration so all of the effect that you see in this particular experiment in the waveform is due to microstructure. There's nothing else happening here. I'll come back to this at the end of the talk. Okay, so uh, what are our problems then? Our first problem is to say, okay, we, we want to understand the scale dependent physics, like waves, right? Uh, primarily mechanical and EM waves. And if we can do that, then maybe we can create this wave scope, this methodology or a framework to get micro scale information from long scale data. Now, I have not made up this problem. People have been researching this for decades and we'll, we'll talk about some of the 
way in which people approach this, but feel free to ask me more questions at the end. The issue with this question is that before you can answer this question about physics and scaling and getting properties, you have to worry about this problem. And th that is the problem of describing microheterogeneity. If we have a material that is microheterogeneous, how do we describe it in the first place? Because describing a heterogeneity is the key to then talking about effective properties and how we estimate heterogeneity back from the properties at long wavelengths. Now, typically in geoscience, we have these two N members here. On the left, uh, we have what are called inclusion-based theories. Okay, so just to name a few, we have Ashel B. Stenser, which uses ellipsoids. We have the so-called penny-shaped cracks. We have spheroidal pores. We have all sorts of geometrically well-defined shapes, which we can describe with math and we can relate them to effective properties. Now, these are both, both pros and cons. The best thing about these is, of course, because they're mathematically well-defined, we can write closed forms. And if we write closed forms, we get great physical insight as to what is going on with the effective properties. The biggest issue with these, however, is, of course, if you look on the right-hand side, which are CT pictures of actual rocks, uh, the microheterogeneity often looks nothing like the geometries that we can describe with math. So they're too simplistic. But the worst part of these is when you have microheterogeneity that has different types of features. So for example, suppose you have a porous medium that also has cracks, that makes it very difficult because each one's pores and cracks are described by different models that are not compatible with one another. So you have to put them one at a time. And because these models are nonlinear on the background, the order of which you use them matters to the answer. So if you switch between pores and cracks in the order, you get a different answer. And this is bad for this problem. You don't want that to happen. On the other end of the spectrum, we have what is now considered the de facto standard for talking about microheterogeneity, which is digital rock physics. And so we usually get CT images or SEM images, and we do some sort of uh, min, uh, image processing to them, and we extract properties and so on. The great thing about this is, of course, these are very realistic uh, because they come from real samples. That is the biggest advantage of them. But that's also their downfall. You can see that each one of these samples is extremely complex. So extracting what is abstract or general about each sample is very difficult because these are samples. These are very complex. So is there something in between? Um, and that's really important. The reason why we want to ask something in between is because of this, right? So what we want is to talk about statistically significant, realistic descriptions of microheterogeneous materials. And how can we use such types of descriptions to quantify complexity at the micro scale and their processes? So we'll talk a fair bit about, about this. And this is where this topic intersects with material science quite a bit and what has been done in material science for the past couple of decades. So first we'll talk about statistical microstructure descriptors. Okay, so I will tell you a little bit about these. Uh, then we'll talk about how these relate to effective wave properties. And I'm going to use a experimental example from Susanna Hunts to best explain what happens when we describe microstructure and how it relates to effective properties as we generally understand it. Then we're going to take that understanding and look at our first step here in trying to estimate microstructure properties from frequency-dependent effective wave properties through this uh, AI-driven Bayesian inference scheme. Okay, so what are these statistical microstructure descriptors? Well, these are something that is in between a mathematically well-defined function but that also describes highly complex materials. So here is one that's existed for quite a while. Okay, so these are called correlation functions. To understand these, we're gonna talk about a few concepts here. So think of a material to begin with that has two phases. So for example, the rock phase is the white part, pores are the black part. They don't have to be pores or matrix, they could be two minerals, they could be any two phases that we like. But for simplicity, let's talk about two phases. Now we can describe these phases simply by an indicator function and it's binary, it's either one or zero, whether it's white or black. If we take a 
ensemble average of just this volume indicator, this binary indicator over the volume, this gives us what is called the volume fraction. If these were pores, volume fraction would simply be porosity. It's easy to understand. But now we can define a higher order descriptor by saying what is the probability that any two points in the material lie on the same phase. So you can see that these two points here lie on the same phase. Those two do not lie on the same phase at the same distance r. Now we can define this by cross-correlating these binary functions and taking ensemble averages, which are generally functions of two points in space. And if we assume the material to be statistically isotropic, we can simplify this to a distance. Okay, so what's the probability that two points that lie at a specific distance, regardless of their orientation, lie on the same phase? This is not a necessary assumption, but it is one that we use often in numerical calculations. Okay, so far so good. So a two-point correlation function is the probability that two points lie on the same phase. Can we keep making this higher order? The answer is we can. We can actually define what is called an endpoint correlation function. That's the probability that endpoints lie in the same phase. In the picture here, I'm showing you the cartoon describing a three-point correlation function, which is the probability that three points lie in the same phase. Now, what's interesting from material science is that they tell us uh, theoretical material scientists tell us that if we had access to the nine, uh, the endpoint correlation function, we can describe any material uniquely in terms of their geometry. Unfortunately, we cannot compute anything greater than three, regardless of what computers or clusters or supercomputers we're using. And the reason for this is that sampling these functions numerically is a combinatorial problem and it scales very badly with dimensions and there's no way around it okay so uh, computing anything greater than three uh, at this point is computationally intractable just keep that in mind this means that we're generally using for the most part if we're using endpoint correlation functions two-point correlation functions so how far do two-point correlation functions go in describing materials right so here on the left you see examples of two-point correlation functions canonical ones that we can get from textbooks okay on the right, you see statistical realizations of materials from these two-point correlation functions. It's very important to remember that a single two-point correlation function described, described infinite realizations of materials that have the same statistical two-point properties. Okay, So when we look at each one of these materials here, they're a single realization of these curves. Notice that we could pick two of these curves here. Let's pick, for example, the uh, green one that is a Debye Rendine medium. You may have heard of this medium before. It's a power specific power law correlation. And here we have a fully penetrable sphere. So this is the medium that we see here in C. We can see the curves arguably look similar, but the media look very different. Right? So two point correlation functions are capable of representing very different and also very realistic materials. So is this useful? for material scientists and how do they use this, right? So they use this to solve a problem called the reconstruction problem. Okay, suppose you have a sample, okay? You have a sample of the Fontainebleau sandstone. And we can see here a 2D um, skeletonized version of the uh, grain pore matrix uh, right here, right? So this is an actual 2D part of the sample. We can take the sample, we can extract the two point correlation function then we solve an inverse problem where we say, give me now a pixelized version of a material that fits the two-point correlation function. So you solve an optimization problem and you get what is called a reconstruction. And here you see a reconstructed version, a new sample of the material that is statistically corresponding to the same sample that you originally had. You see it in 2D, you see it in 3D. Now, arguably this looks realistic, but whether this is a good reconstruction or not depends on what you want to do with this reconstruction. Feel free to ask me questions about that at the end. But for now, let's just say that this is a good reconstruction in a statistical sense and that the materials look fairly alike. But can this fail? And the answer is also yes. So let's look at an example where it fails. So here you see the sample and the sample comes from a laser speckle pattern pointed at a specific microheterogeneous material. You can see right away that there are at least two um, 
scales of correlation in this material because you can see the big black blobs and they correlate spatially with each other. You can also see that there are these black lines that have orientations and correlate with each other. So there's at least two scales here. Now, if we sample the two-point correlation function and then reconstruct it, uh, we get this reconstruction. And you can see that this fails dramatically. This looks nothing like the sample. The reason this fails is that uh, this material has high order statistical correlations and S2 or the two point correlation function is too low order for this material. But I said that we cannot really compute anything with n greater than three. That's very difficult. Do we have any other alternatives? So my colleagues at Arizona in 2019 proposed another way of looking at high order correlations. These are the so-called polytope functions. So polytope functions are fixed geometric shapes. Okay, they could be Euclidean or um, uh, Archimedean shapes, uh, but they have fixed vertices and fixed orientations. When we, pick, when we pick these fixed shapes with orientations and vertices, what happens is that we can check the probability that the vertices fall or do not fall in a single phase. Because they're fixed shape and orientation, to scale them takes only a single parameter. So we can change the size of these and scale them with a single parameter. That means that computing these is just as efficient as computing a two-point correlation function. Now, are these useful in high-order correlations? Let's look here at a synthetic example. Uh, what you see here is four materials that have the same volume fraction, right? So imagine these triangles are pores, triangular pores oriented in different directions, as you can see with the colors. Uh, the porosity or volume fraction is fixed. In fact, when you look at these probability curves, the value at the origin is always volume fraction or porosity. So you can see they all have the same. But if we look at the polytope, so B, C, D, and E are each the curves from different polytopes for each one of the materials, you can compare the color of the curves to the color of the materials here. So you can see which is which. Notice for when we pick the polytopes that are vertical triangles, they uh, peak at uh, the volume fraction as they should, they decrease exponentially, but then they peak again at a distance. That's because for both this material here and that material here, because the triangles are vertically oriented, we can fit bigger triangles into them at larger distances. Likewise, the same thing happens for the colors here that you see that have uh, horizontal triangles. As we increase the order of the polytopes, these curves also look more complex. And this means that we can cap capture here geometrical information uh, with a high degree of sensitivity. And we can also capture an isotropy right? at relatively little computational cost because these scale with a single parameter. Now, if we look at uh, other examples here, now we see impenetrable spheres. You can think of, for example, glass beads are very commonly used in experiments. And you can see here in black, the two-point correlation function. And in other colors, you see other polytopes. N3 means a triangle, four, a square, six, a hexagon, eight, an octagon. Uh, you can see here these other curves. I'll tell you what they are in a minute. Um, and at the bottom, you, we again see the Fontainebleau sandstone. And you can see that the Fontainebleau sandstone does not oscillate as much as the, the spheres. That's because it's less self-correlated, uh, which means this material is genuinely more uh, random than the glass beads would be, for example. Now, like I said, these probability curves all have volume fraction at the origin. And the way they tend to some number at larger distances here depends on volume fraction, actually. So genuinely, it's difficult to compare curves between two materials of different volume fractions. So what we have are these Fn functions that you see here. I'm going to show you equations for them in the next slide. But what you need to see here is that these curves oscillate between 1 and 0. They're made this way so that we can always compare them irrespective of volume fraction. So they only capture the patterns of the geometric correlation. So these F functions carry geometric information that is independent of volume fraction. So just to show you how you calculate these, and in case of the two-point correlation functions, these are called scaled covariance functions. 
you can see here how the, the, they depend on the two-point correlation function, on the volume fraction, and the relative volume fraction. So you end, you end up with something here that's scaled between one and zero. And we can calculate a similar thing for the polytopes. So these are the polytopes. This is volume fraction. Very similar calculation that you see here. Again, the important thing to remember is these are, these are volume fraction independent, and they provide geometric information. So far, so good. Um, if there are any clarification questions, please write them down in the chat, and then we'll address them at the end of the talk. Because now we're going to shift um, gears a little bit, and we're going to talk about effective properties. And we're going to talk about using these uh, descriptors to capture microheterogeneity and its features in effective properties. So one thing that I won't show you here is the theory and the calculation of the effective property themselves, because it's long and a little bit technical. But what you need to know is that what we've developed is based on what are called strong contrast expansions. These strong contrast expansions use the actual wave equation and the green functions of the actual wave equation, which means that we can produce effective properties that are frequency dependent and that capture wave behavior. That's important, as we'll see here in the example of EM. Okay, so in this EM example, we have those six materials that we saw two-point correlations for before, and we see again realizations of the materials to remind you what these materials can look like. In all of these calculations, we have dielectric properties for the white phase and for the black phase. There is no conductivity. And dielectric, dielectric constant is purely real for both black and white phase. What this means is that if the material were only black or only white, there would be no attenuation. There's only wave propagation. Now, what you see here on the graph is you see the real part of the effective dielectric constant. So this is telling us about wave speed scaled by the white part. At the horizontal axis, you see this calculated as a function of contrast. So the white part is kept fixed, and then we change the contrast relative to the black part. The volume fraction is also fixed at 10%. Notice that all of the curves overlap. So regardless of the material microstructure having very different geometries, the dependence on wave speed as a function of contrast does not depend on the geometry of the material. This means that if we wanted to extract material geometry, say permeability, which is related to geometry, from wave speed, this is bad news because we can't tell the difference. In fact, we can say uh, that effective wave speed, even though I'm not showing you different volume fractions, but we'll see this in a different example later on, strongly depends on contrast and volume fraction. In other words, it depends on the wave speeds themselves and if this were porous porosity, but it does not depend on the geometric pattern. But remember I said that the theory we used uses the actual wave equation. That means that at certain frequencies, the effect of uh, Rayleigh scattering occurs. So Rayleigh scattering is a sub-wavelength scattering effect that produces attenuation. It's the same effect that makes the sky blue, for example, right? So let's look at effective attenuation here. Now, remember, either black or white are not attenuated, but the effective properties are because we use a wave equation effective property calculation. Now you can see effective attenuation as a function of contrast for a fixed volume fraction. Now we can see that the curves depart from each other, showing us that attenuation, unlike wave speed, is dependent on the geometry of the material. Uh, so attenuation is still strongly controlled by contrast and volume fraction, but it is also controlled by geometry. Now, let's appreciate how this relates to seismic or mechanics a little bit better using an actual rock physics example. So Susanna Hongs here conducted a uh, compaction example and monitored it in real time using CT imaging. The right or on the left, you see the picture of the sample before compaction. Uh, on the right, you see it post compaction. In fact, you can see the piston here, the metal piston that compacted the sample. 
right away, you can see that the porous structures have changed because the material has compacted. Now, uh, the images are one-to-one. -one, so this is about uh, half a millimeter across, and this is about 1.5 millimeter uh, uh, vertically. We're going to look at the uh, um, statistical properties of the material uh, on this red part, as well as on the blue part, which we'll refer to as top and bottom, of course, and before and after. So if we look at the calculation of our statistical micro descriptors, here they are. Uh, you can see two point correlation functions in blue. You see polytopes in these other colors here. In brown, you see something called a lineal path function. Feel free to ask me about this at the end. But this is another descriptor which we use to decide the size of pores because where they depart from the two-point correlation functions, we can measure the size of a pore or the average size of a pore. The first thing I want you to notice here is that remember I said that at the origin, these values are porosity or volume fraction. At the top, you can see the porosity decreases, and that's very visible in the images. At the bottom, por porosity actually increases. Now you may ask, how does that happen? It happens because this sandstone here is the Slochteren sandstone, which is uh, from the Groningen field in the Netherlands. The sandstone in this sample is jacketed by, by a fluid under pressure on the sides. The pressure of the fluid is not high enough to sustain the medium's Poisson's ratio. So at the bottom, the sample gets a little bit fatter and then accommodates the uh, crushing from the sample at the top. So this means that something happened to the pores here. You can see the pores kind of look smaller. We'll show you that they actually are quantitatively, but they also rearranged in a way that increased porosity. And we'll be able to capture this from the statistical descriptor. Let's see how. Now, remember, I said these curves, uh, because of volume fraction, they're difficult to compare. So we use the curves, those F curves that depend only on geometry and no longer in volume fractions. Now, remember, they go from one to zero. And now we see the differences between before and after here on the right-hand side. Notice that in these first few distances here, at the top, we have a big bump. What this bump tells us is exactly by how much uh, the pores have been uh, squeezed. And the pores have been squeezed quite dramatically. That's what decreased porosity. We can also see from the orange line that uh, anisotropy has also decreased. This is probably due to the fact that this part of the sample has this big crack in it that you can see here that creates statistical anisotropy for this particular part of the sample. At the bottom, though, we can see that the pores also decrease, but they decrease less than they do at the top. So they're smaller than before, but they're not as small as they are at the top. More importantly, we can see a negative bump here at 20 pixels that says that even though we decrease the size of the pores, the pores have rearranged themselves. So now we have more pores at distance. So we have smaller pores, but we have more pores. And this is how we've accommodated for a greater porosity. Please remember this because we'll see this in the effective properties again in a minute. So noticeable changes in volume fracture and fraction and geometry. Now, with our strong contrast expansions, we can now predict the effective properties of this material. And we do so by assigning values to the rock matrix and to the fluid in the pores. Okay, so there was no, in this particular uh, experiment, there was no direct sonic measurements, unfortunately. So we have to do this by model. Now, we know the properties of the Slochter and Sandstone very well because this is controlled by my friend Suzanne in the lab and in the fluids uh, we put on from literature. So let's fill these pores first with water. Okay, now, what am I showing you here? I'm showing you two plots. On the left, effective wave speed. On the right, effective attenuation. Remember, effective attenuation here now occurs both because of scattering, but also because now we are also considering the rock and the fluid themselves to be attenuated. Uh, now, I want you to pay attention to the horizontal axis here. You see lambda Q over L. Now, lambda Q is the dominant wavelength. And L is the medium's characteristic length scale. Okay, this comes from, remember I said that where the brown departs from the uh, blue, we get a measurement. So that's what gives us our L. And just so you know, that's roughly about 0.5. 
a few pixels across. So about this size here compared to uh, the samples that you see. So that's the dominant length scale. Now, you can see here that we go from four times that length scale to 20 times that length scale. This means that uh, on the left of these plots, we actually have a high frequency. And on the right, we have a low frequency. In real terms, uh, for this size of an experiment, this here is uh, 1.5 uh, megahertz. Uh, and this here is about um, uh, 0 0.5 megahertz, just so you know. Um, now notice what happens to wave speed, right? At the top, wave speed uh, increases, right? So this is, be uh, sorry, decreases. Am I saying this right? Hold on, I lost my train of thought. Yes, on the top, sorry. Uh, this is uh, the top before, this is the top after, and wave speed increases. So it should, because you've crushed the pores, and the pores are more compliant than the matrix, okay? So wave speed has to increase. At the bottom, porosity de increased, if you remember, so wave speed decreases, okay? So this is purely due to changes in volume fraction. Notice that the opposite happens to attenuation. Attenuation at the top decreases, and that's because when we crush the pores, we decrease the amount of Rayleigh scattering, and therefore we decrease the amount of attenuation. The opposite happens at the bottom, where attenuation increases because we've increased, remember, the number of pores, and therefore we increased um, uh, uh, effective attenuation. If your eyes are sharp, you can see a little bit of a hockey stick shape here, indicating that there's some dependence with frequency, but not very much, right? Well, in this case, wave speed is mostly controlled by volume fraction. Attenuation is controlled by volume fraction in a little bit by geometry, but mostly volume fraction. But what happens if we're doing, for example, a CO2 sequestration experiment, and this water is replaced by gas? Okay, so we're going to replace water by gas. These plots are going to change. So this is with water, gas. Okay? Water, gas. Water, gas. Notice on the left-hand side first that the overall picture didn't change very much, right? So uh, the top wave speed increased, the bottom wave speed decreased. It mostly doesn't depend on frequency. The only thing that's happened here is that the absolute values have changed because when we fill with gas, the pores are more compliant than before. So the overall effective wave speed is slower. That's the only thing that's different from before. The right-hand side plot, however, is quite different than before. Now we can see that there is a significant dependence on frequency here between a quarter of a wavelength and about a tenth of a wavelength here. Right? This dependence is telling us about geometric information. Now, how do we know this tells us about geometric information? I want you to pay attention to the solid right, uh, red curve and the dashed blue curve. The solid red curve is for the top before. The, the dashed blue curve is for the top after. So now I'll go up back some few slides. Notice that the top before had a certain value of porosity. Top after is close to that value. So this here and that here have similar porosity, but notice that the geometry of the pores is very different. Right? So you can see right here that they start at similar values of scattering attenuation. And they slowly taper to different values because the geometry of the pores is different. So right here, we can see that uh, attenuation behavior significantly changes when we change the content of the pores. And this significant change also carries information about the change in the geometry. Okay? We did not use any of the existing fluid substitution theories. All we used here is our knowledge of the properties of the fluid and of the geometry of the material. So this means all we did here is to show you the dependence of the effective properties as a function of frequency uh, with a uh, microstructure. The other thing I want you to remember, and we can discuss this at the end, is that this dependence on frequency exists at a specific range of frequencies, and then it flattens out. Please remember this specific comment because I'll come back to this when I conclude the talk and we can even have a discussion about it afterwards. Now 
Here we're only showing you some modeling based on the experiment and in our estimated uh, microstructures. Remember, these curves are computed from the microstructure curves, not from the structure of the rock from the images, right? Now, could we take this as data and estimate microstructures back? That is the thing that we're actually interested in. And this leads us to the last part of our talk, and that's where we talk about inference. So how do we treat this problem? Well, the relationship between the microstructure descriptors, so curves like the ones that you see in these plots here, so you can see the Fs, you can see some S2s, you can pick different types of these curves, um, and the properties of the, sub, uh, of the microstructure, namely volume fraction and contrast, the relationship between these curves, volume fraction contrast, and effective properties is actually highly nonlinear. So if you wanted to do an inversion in a Bayesian sense, your best choice would be to choose something like a Markov chain Monte Carlo sampler. But of course, you'd have to repeat that for every time you get the data. What is good news in this problem is that from our material scientist colleagues, we've learned that there are only a, a region of statistical correlations that allows for realistic microstructures. These curves cannot have any behavior. This means that we can generate a priori a number of curves that describe many realistic materials, even if we've never seen them before. And that means that we can then assign contrasts related to different rocks, and we can basically train a random forest here. So a random forest is a supervised machine learning scheme uh, that segments the data in a regression setting. And for each data point that you, that you give, it ends up with what are called random trees here. At the end of these trees, we have values for the regression inference. You do, you do this for all of your data. You do this for many realizations of your data subsampled randomly. And by applying statistics to the trees themselves, uh, we can get full predictors for the prior distribution here that we can use to then uh, get uh, what we want using a Bayesian, uh, using Bayes' theorem. So this is uh, the data, the, um, uh, uh, so this is the posterior of the model. Uh, this here is an objective function, if you'd like. Uh, and this is the priors that we've constructed using the random forests. So we, if we do this, uh, we can get estimates right away. Now, we did this not only for acoustics, but we did this actually for elasticity. So here we have an example. So we used a paper by a colleague of ours, Lucas Mosser. So he's, he's, he's written great papers about the reconstruction problem. Here you see glass beads. You see the Berea sandstone and you see the Catan limestone here as examples. In orange, you see the actual two point correlation of the samples that we got from Luca, Lucas Mosser's libraries. And in blue, you see our fits. So you see the average fit in solid blue and in light blue, you see the 90% confidence interval. In the dashed lines, you see our estimates for the average size of the pores in each one of these samples. We made the data here to be elastic, and we said, well, what if we pretend the data to be acoustic only? This is something we often do in geophysics. And what if we use the fully elastic data? Notice uh, that, for example, if we look at the sandstone here, both the acoustic and the elastic give decent predictions of the two-point correlation functions, but the elastic does a better job and yields a tighter confidence interval. In some cases, like the case of the bead pack that you see right here, because the bead pack is oscillatory, this is much harder to constrain. You can see that acoustics fails to constrain the oscillations. In fact, uh, the acoustic gives us a fairly biased uh, answer here. We would be tempted to think that this is a well-resolved answer because the confidence intervals seem to be tight, but you can see this is a biased answer. Whereas by using the fully elastic uh, data here at a range of frequencies, we constrain this much better. The reason for this physically is that the wavelength of P waves and shear waves are different. So the dependence 
in geometry as a function of frequency uh, complement each other from these two wave modes in resolving uh, the structure of these more complicated two-point correlation functions. Now, this result that you see here is very promising. Okay, this result says that if we can measure wave speed and attenuation as a function of frequency, we may stand a chance of not only resolving contrast or um, uh, volume fraction, but also the geometry of the material. This has long been a holy grail for this field. And now we think that we are much closer to getting this. So let's go back, just to close this off, to that experiment of Susanna Hans. She published this only a couple of years ago. And even then, uh, very few people knew what to do with the uh, shape of these waveforms here. And now we've seen from this talk that travel time is not very sensitive to uh, the changes in microstructure other than the compressibility of the pores themselves because she's replaced uh, those uh, brine with gas. And so you can see that in fact, it did get slower uh, as predicted as we saw in our numerical examples. But you can see now that the differences in waveform are much more significant and we can predict them uh, based on this finite frequency theory that uses the statistics of the material as opposed to each realization. It's very important that we use statistics because you can see that in the inverse problem, we would not have any hopes of reconstructing something like these pictures here because there'd be far too many degrees of freedom, but we now stand to reconstruct information about the statistical geometry of the material. So some takeaways, so statistical micro descriptors are especially powerful quantitative descriptors. Now you can choose them for this reconstruction problem, which is making new samples, and you can choose them to analyze rock physics and different changes to digital rock materials. They're good for that, but there are other options for that. They're very, very good for our inverse problem because they are a statistical description. It's key to note that if we're after the geometry of the material, attenuation is essential. Without attenuation, there is no information on geometry. And now we have a framework upon which we're going to build now the actual seismic, ultrasonic, full waveform inversion, AVO kind of tools to try and then go back to the statistics of the microstructure. We hope to also look into what are called cross-property relations, which is, for example, taking data from both seismic and EM and trying to relate it to permeability, for example, which is a fluid flow property as opposed to a wave propagation property. So with that, I thank you, and I'll take any questions you may have. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you very much for uh a very interesting presentation. <clears throat> so I will uh, suggest now to switch on the videos. Maybe, yes. And um, let's see if we have any question from the attendees. I uh, don't see at the moment, but no, in the I chat or in the any either. I don't know if you received, uh, Diego, any Not, not yet. So while uh, people is warming up, maybe I have a question for you. Sure. So uh, if you can go back to the slide where you're talking about uh, the um, uh, bias theorem, where you are combining your prior knowledge of the model and uh, the likelihood function to get the posterior probability density. Yeah. Uh, you are saying here that uh, you're going to um, uh, to be helped by some machine learning uh, uh, approach. Yeah. Uh, but it's not completely clear to me uh, how, because when, when, when we are thinking about machine learning, uh, I don't know, this is uh, probably uh, uh, unsupervised method, right? No, this is supervised. So this you need to know, yeah, this, you need to have the input and output, right? Okay, so what is uh, exactly the uh, input that you're using for, uh, uh, for teaching the network uh, to build up this uh, uh, density of M? It's not very So the input, the input are the digital samples of curves like the curves that you see here. 
Okay. Is, each sample of these curves is an input, right? Uh, okay. Together, together with contrast and volume fraction. Okay. okay. So, so that's the input. Uh, um, then what you do? Uh, sorry, because we're doing the inference problem. So the, the steps are like this: you take each one of these curves, contrast and volume fraction, and then you model uh, P wave and shear wave velocity and attenuation as a function of frequency. You have all of that done, right? You take then. Let's go back to these curves. You're not. I don't have the curves on the slides of P and S waves, but basically you have these curves that you see right here, right? Uh, take one of them, just a solid red, right? That's P. Velocity and attenuation as a function of frequency. So then you have two other curves, velocity and attenuation for the S as a function of frequency. Okay. Each one of those samples is part of the data for one realization of a curve. Okay. You know, okay. You take these, you take these for all of the curves with all of the different values of contrast and volume fraction, and you have a very large data set, right? Now each of these are the inputs and the output are uh, the output are the values of the curves okay and contrast and volume fraction right now each random tree will take a very small subset of the data at random okay and then the decision tree simply does a cutoff a hard cutoff between the values if the value is smaller than this or smaller than that which one is the does the data lie and then he puts it here then it does the cutoff again, then it puts it there. The cutoff, because the, because the input data is multidimensional, every time you do a cutoff, you do a cutoff in a different dimension. You never do a cutoff in the same dimension, right? So imagine, imagine you have a two parameter problem and you're doing regression. A random tree will cut in this parameter and will say, oh, the data is here. And then it will cut in this parameter and then say, oh, the data is there. And then it cuts in this parameter. So that's how our decision tree keeps cutting off the data until it ends in these leaves. And then you have these leaves say, this small subset of the data corresponds to this small subset of the output. Okay? Okay. So you do this for many trees. Each tree sees a, a, a random subset of the whole data. And then you take all of the leaves in all of the trees, and then you can then do statistics on the leaves and then you get the full uh, inference statistic. Yeah, you have your decision graph basically, and you can apply Correct. to other uh, samples. Correct. And uh, okay, then I'm curious why you choose this type of uh, machine learning algorithm. Uh, uh, was there any other options uh, like uh, uh, some neural network or well, other I type of? You, uh... Yeah, I can tell you why I didn't choose neural network because I don't have that much experience with machine learning yet. We have some. So we have some experience with convolutional neural nets. Um, we have some experience uh, with decision tree, with, with random forests. And we have some experience with autoencoders. That's all we know, right, in terms of machine learning. But what I needed, what I wanted, is something that was fully Bayesian, right, where I could do the full statistics and extract the priors out of, right? Now, neural nets are not very good at that. Neural nets are very good at deterministic answers. So within the neural network, there's the idea of an implicit prior. But mm -hmm. if you give a neural network one input, it gives you one output. Right? Here, because the decision trees capture the entire statistic, if I give it one input, I get out a distribution, the full posterior now. This is the reason why I picked this. So this is the, the answer that comes out of this is the equivalent of running something like a Markov chain Monte Carlo, mm. except everything is done a priori because we have a, a selection of priors as opposed to having to walk in the space of the posterior to map the full posterior, which is what you do if you only have one data and you want one model, right? So it's sense? an it's another way of sampling the distribution, basically. Yeah, exactly. We haven't. I mean, one of the things that's in the pipeline. I need another master student because <laughs> he's graduated now. 
and we're trying to fund this so we can get PhDs to work on it. But uh, comparing this with uh, Monte Carlo is something we want to do because here, of course, you end up being tied to your choice of the priors, right? So the choice of the priors, if you made a bad choice, can bias your result. Right? So, for example, one of the things that we learned, it, it, this sandstone here is actually very close to a Debye median. So if we picked Debye only priors, we would get a fit that would have a much smaller confidence interval, right? Because the variance in the priors is smaller because they all have the same functional dependence. But uh, that would also bias the answer. If we apply the same Debye only to this here, right? To the uh, bead pack, we would get something that would just look like a power law and it would completely miss the oscillations. And it would look like we resolved it well because the confidence interval would look small, but the bias is large because it wasn't in the space of the priors. This is actually, I like this exercise because it shows how important the prior is in machine mm -hmm. learning. How you can get severe bias by just making a wrong choice in the prior or by making the correct choice in the prior, you can really improve your confidence interval. It's a double-edged sword, really. Okay, thank you for uh, the answer. Um, I received a couple of questions from uh, Yapmont. Uh, the first one is, uh, as attenuation and dispersion are related, but which measure can be more accurately used? Uh, I will maybe unmute uh, Yap. Okay. That's my, that, that is my question. I can't get my camera working. I don't see where I can do that, but at least I have the question that you can measure, say, dispersion, you can measure the attenuation. Now, they are related, of course, but it could be that one of the measurements is maybe more easily to do and more accurate than the other. So, how do you do that? Yeah, uh, hold on a second. I'm just going to close my blinds here because you can see the light on my face. One second. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a difficult question to answer, but I'll do my best at this point. Okay, so part of what we're doing next, so we have some uh, spectral element simulations to confirm that our calculations are accurate. Okay, so we trust these curves in terms of their absolute values. Now, look at the wavelength scales here, right? When you get close to, the reason we start at four is that the Born limit says that anything greater than four leads to coherent scattering, right? So um, dispersion will occur for the most part, I think. That's my intuition because we haven't actually done this yet. Uh, close to four, right? When you get to much smaller than four, if the medium were completely homogeneous and just had this heterogeneity at the small scale, there should be no dispersion, right? Just like you, you see the blue sky, uh, generally you don't see dispersion, you just see a single frequency color, right? You just see a, a damping at a specific length scale. Yes. Um, and so dispersion will appear in reality because the medium is heterogeneous at multiple scales. And that's the part that I think, so my personal intuition is that Dispersion and this approach together can help us try to unravel what's happening at slightly different scales. Um, does that kind of answer your question? Because we actually haven't done it, so I don't have a good, it's just my intuition. It's not really an informed answer. Right, and in addition, if I may, I have the question that if we look at seismic wavelength, then we are probably going to be at very larger numbers than 12, 14, or 16. So, so uh, what can we get out of the seismic? Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks for asking that. That's why I said pay attention, guys, to where this range is, right? So there's yes. two ways of thinking about this. If you say the, if you say what I want to measure is at a length scale that I know, right? If you say, this is the poor length scale, I know this number, and that's what I want to measure. This tells you 
that size may carry some information about geometry because look at the difference between the blue and the red here. It carries some, but not all, right? right. So, but, so that's one aspect, right? So this means, so one of the things that I have in mind going forward with proposals and so on is that actually when we look at problems like CO2 sequestration or geothermal and whatnot, we need to start thinking what are new measurements we can make that are closer to the reservoir that we can make it more often that are not going to they're not going to probe a large volume of rock but they can probe closer to the scales that we want right so we're going to have to trade off i think in reality but the other way to look at it suppose you have seismic data right vsp or surface seismic data, and you see frequency dependent attenuation and you think that it's related to microstructure like this. If you see it, it means that it is related to, micro, to microstructure at certain scales of the seismic, right? Not necessarily a pore scale, but it tells you which scales it could be. And I think that's also important information that we weren't, at least I wasn't aware of before, right? Okay, yeah, thanks. If, if I may, one other question is related to the, uh, can this be applied also to uh, using electromagnetic waves? Absolutely, is the answer. So uh, that's why I showed, because I wanted to highlight this, that's why I showed uh, these calculations here. So these are effective calculations of the effective dielectric oh, yeah. property, right? Yeah, right. Uh, so you can. Uh, we have the, all the equations. We can do it. In fact, it's part of the proposal that we're write, writing out now to combine um, at least in the numerics, but and also with the BUM in Germany. So this is the German Material Science Institute. We want to do uh, joint ultrasound and radar for uh, non-destructive testing. Um, so I think I think it not only can it can it be done, but I think it will help this problem tremendously. One thing I didn't say when I showed this result here is that in order to constrain geometry, we need to either know volume fraction or contrast if we don't know both of these things at once we cannot get geometry at least not right away and that's because those two things control these properties way more than geometry does but i think if we have access to two fields because the contrast is now dictated by two completely physical properties i think we may be able to unravel contrast volume fraction and geometry at least that's what we want to test what we don't know yet Okay, thanks. Yeah, this is uh, very interesting. So it's like a joint uh, inversion or joint prediction uh, of this probability distribution based on different measurements that are uh, seismic and EM. Yeah. So it's quite clever and uh, interesting, yes. Yes, because I would like to extend that actually. You know, there is this theory about seismoelectric or yeah. seismoelectromagnetic. So yeah. that seismic induces electromagnetic waves which you can also measure. Yeah. Is yeah. that going to be applicable and useful in your kind of study? Yeah, I yeah. wrote a strong contrast expansion for any PDE that is either a diffusion or wave equation or any combination thereof. It it just looks nasty for the seismoelectric problem, so I hadn't I haven't looked at it. <laughs> but uh, we have the form of the equation that we have is general. In fact, I can show you what the principle is like, if you like equations. Yes, it always sure. looks like this. So uh, you have a field, you write uh, something like a lippmann schwinger integral, right? and that yeah. has the contrast between your reference medium uh, here, sigma p in this case, and the change that is due to the contrast that you've introduced. Uh, we write two fields. Uh, the one thing that is difficult to do, uh, and that might be difficult in the seismoelectric problem, but it's something we have to think of, is that we have to know the analytical Green's functions for the far field problem and for the full near field problem with like just a Laplacian term, because these two fields that you see here, C and U, this is called a cavity field. These things appear a lot in EM, so if you're familiar with EM. The relationship between these fields is what allows us to find these effective properties, because you can see here that uh, averaging C this is an ensemble average of C versus this phi, which contains the contrast, is related to the LE. LE is the thing that carries the effective property. 
uh, in the specific case of a scalar acoustic medium, I'm showing you the equations here, uh, you end up, this is the effective property. You get this ratio, you have some quantities here. Uh, beta is a contrast con quantity, that's all you need to know. It's a function of dimensions, whether it's two or three dimensions, it doesn't really matter. But it's a, it's a contrast term. And the thing that's important is A, right? So A is an integral over the distance of, the, of, that, of that curve, of those cur oscillating curves uh, that describe the materials. That's the S that you see here. And it has the actual Green's function of your PDE in it, right? And this yeah. is where if we have the Green's functions for seismoelectrics, we'll have something that will look exactly like this, except there will be tensors um, and we need to know these Green's functions. Okay, thanks. And we need to know if uh, this effect is significant as, at our specific frequencies, I guess. And uh... But you can use the calculation to find out what the frequencies are for any given scale, right? Okay, yeah, makes sense. Okay, so let's see. Um, it's already 8.16. Are there any other questions from the uh, Q&A or... Uh, uh... Florence, I don't see any other question. Do you? Yes, one just came right okay. now uh, from Siamak. It says, thank you for the nice talk. To check my understanding, I need to ask this question. You need physical samples from the intended area and based on the information you get from the physical samples, you make an a priori, uh, you make a priori using AI. And then you use the Bayesian framework to make your posterior. And the AI part is done once and you don't update the prior the priori in the process. You can also read it from the uh, I think I understood. I I yeah. I, 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 I also unmuted the CMAC, so if you want you can uh, you can uh, explain. I think I understood the question. Um, so yes. So suppose, let's do a complete hypothetical here. Suppose you're sitting at uh, Sleipner, okay? And you want to try, okay, put aside the discussion we just had about the actual scales, because actually the scale of seismic here, as we saw, is not very sensitive to the actual geometry of pores, given the discussion we just had. But let's pretend for a moment that would be the case, okay? Um, I'll go back to here. Now, the first thing, the most intelligent thing to do would indeed be to have, if you have plugs, if you have samples from your actual field that you believe to be representative, then yes, the, the best thing to do is to get uh, samples and then, you know, take them through this exercise here, extract the microstructural properties. Uh, if you have access to doing some sonic measurements or measurements that give you some handle on the properties, the contrast of the phases that you're after, much the better. And then you can take that information and you can train the, the random forest for your specific samples. So then when you get the values coming from the data that are now no longer your samples, right? They are distributed in space. You can take these point wise values as a function of frequency and use the inference to populate this medium here with those properties, right? So I think that's that's part of what you understood. That is the principle. But uh, if you remember when I was describing when I was describing uh, this here, I also said, or material science colleagues inform us that there are only a few a range of the shapes of curves that are allowed to exist in order for a material to be a physical material, to be realizable. That's great news because it means that before we've ever seen any rocks, we can fill up this space. We can assign a bunch of um, VPVS properties and ranges of porosity that we think before we even saw a sample that we think applied to that field and that already allows us to train a random forest predictor. Okay, so we can do it without ever seeing a sample. If we have samples, that was the discussion related to what Diego asked, or he asked, uh, 
you know, what happens, I'm paraphrasing now, uh, Diego, what happens when you change the priors? And I said, you could fix the prior to be a dead by medium only, right? And then I said, if you do that, you uh, make your confidence interval tighter. So you think you're more certain about the answer, but you're only more certain about the answer because your prior is restricted. If you believe that your samples that came from your actual fields are sufficiently uh, representative, then that's the advantage of actually having samples. You can make this prior uh, more biased towards your samples, but your results coming out of that prior will also be more certain in terms of the variance, the output variance. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thank you, Ivan. Uh, you fully answered my question. Thank you. Very well. Uh, do we have any other question, Florence? Not at the moment. No. Then I will uh, maybe uh, close the meeting with a couple of uh, uh, announcement. Uh, so let me share my screen. Okay, so first of all, the uh, usual acknowledgements. Sorry. So we want to thank Ivan, uh, uh, of course, for the interesting talk and uh, also the discussion. Uh, uh, Aramco is providing the WebEx uh, platform as usual. Our friends from the different local chapters and also the uh, Oslo Society of Exploration Geophysicists and the student chapter, uh, particular DOGS and uh, Aachen. And uh, uh, the announcement is related to our next event that will be after summer. So we will take a break uh, uh, in July and August. Uh, the next event we will be in September. And uh, also this topic will be very interesting. It's about virtual reality applied to geoscience. So uh, with this, I uh, wish you a good summer and uh, uh, we will uh, keep in touch during these months, uh, but uh, we will see each other again uh, in September. Uh, thank you all of you for uh, attending this meeting. And uh, again, thank you even for the talk. Thank you also. Thank you.